Silkies are one of the, if not the most popular, bantam chicken breed in the United States of America, sold by many breeders, hatcheries, and farm supply stores across the country. The American Bantam Association ranks them the fourth most popular bantam breed shown as of 2020. And this is only counting birds shown, not the sheer amount of people that own or breed silkies that haven't ventured into the show world. As great as the popularity of this breed is from a conservation standpoint, it leads to a lot of misinformation regarding them. So today, I'd like to offer tips to those raising silkies for the first time, dispel myths regarding them, and clear up some general misleading or bad information surrounding them, and finish with some advice to any of you planning to purchase silkies to avoid getting duped into buying either low-quality silkies or silky mixes. So if you're looking to breed silkies or just want real silkies, be sure to stick around until the end. So with that, I'd like to first mention how do silkies differ from other breeds. Although silkies are still chickens, their feather structure is very different from other breeds because they lack the barbules on their feathers, meaning they don't zip together to repel water like normal feathers. Silkies also have black skin due to fibromelanosis, which is not a disease but a dominant gene that causes dark pigment. Silkies also have five toes on each foot, blue earlobes, and feathers on their feet. Silkies come in both bearded and non-bearded varieties, and many different colors. And the American Bantam Association actually recognizes bearded white naked neck silkies. Silkies are actually the only breed, other than the naked neck breed itself, where a naked neck variety is accepted. And just like all other breeds, silkies can come in the frizzle feathering type as well. This video will be split into two sections. In this first part, we will cover the best coop and run setup for silkies, broodiness in silkies, trimming crests, what a vaulted skull is, how to tell if silkies are males or females, problems with external parasites like mites and lice in silkies, and lastly, the topic of the best nutrition for silkies regarding feed and if they really need additional supplementation. The second and final section of this video will be a guide for anybody looking to breed or purchase silkies, going over some common defects and disqualifications in silky confirmation, and clear up a lot of bad information about what a silky truly is. So with that, let's start with housing silkies. Because silkies lack barbules on their feathers, this means you need to be smart in your coop's construction and design to prevent them from getting wet or chilled. The first step in this is having a coop with a covered run. Many people, myself included, who have raised silkies for a long time could probably tell you that silkies aren't the brightest birds you will meet. And sometimes because of this, they might forget to go in their coop, especially after moving when they aren't used to it. Or if there are other birds that are scaring them and they're not comfortable going in their coop, they'll stay outside instead. In addition to that, because of the structure of their feathers, silkies often have trouble climbing steep ramps or flying up to roosts. Because of this, keeping a covered run to make sure your silkies are kept dry, even if they don't make it into the coop at night, is a necessity. Building your coop in a high and dry area to avoid potential flooding is best as well. As far as coop design, because silkies have trouble climbing or flying, this means that their roosting bar should be built much lower, usually at about 12 inches off the coop floor. Personally, I'm a huge fan of what many refer to as a roosting ladder, meaning you have multiple roosting bars at different levels. Having a roosting bar at 6 inches and another at 12 inches should encourage them to fly up to the roost to strengthen their wings. Despite this, some silkies still choose to cuddle together on the floor of a coop, which is why keeping bedding such as pine shavings or straw is really important. As far as nesting boxes, the requirements, one nest box per three birds, is the same for silkies, but silkies are a very maternal breed, meaning they go broody often. The term broody means they want to brood or sit on eggs, and many times silkies will go broody even when eggs aren't present, although collecting eggs daily can help deter it. Because broody silkies also tend to be hard to break, adding extra nest boxes in case a brooding hen is hogging one can be a big help. Some silkies, even when they aren't broody, may choose to sleep in their nest boxes instead of the roosting bars, but this should be deterred to keep the nest boxes cleaner. If you haven't figured it out already, silkies really should be housed by themselves, because larger breeds might pick on them, and as you'll see later in the video, silkies are really prone to injuries on their heads. So, all in all, the biggest things you need to make sure of when building a silky coop and run is having a covered run, having low roosting bars and nest boxes, avoiding ramps, or at least avoiding steep ones, and of course all the other coop necessities like good ventilation, a coop free of drafts, and adequate space for all birds. Because silkies tend to go broody often, they don't tend to be the best egg layers. Although they can be fairly consistent egg layers during their laying period, because some go broody often, they typically only lay 120 to 150 eggs a year, which are usually a light cream to cream color. In my personal experience, I have found that silkies tend to make great mothers, but they're usually more concerned with sitting during the brooding process and continue to sit until all the chicks are hatched. This can vary from bird to bird, but you need to make sure that they get up throughout the day to get food and water for themselves. Offering food and water in the nest box for the chicks after they hatch is essential in my experience, while the hen waits for the rest to hatch. 
Another thing to know about silky care is their crest in the vent area. Some birds with large crests need their crest trimmed around their eyes so they can see better. In addition to that, when breeding silkies, you may need to trim the feathers around the vent area to get better fertility. Personally, I haven't had to do this with most of my males because one of the traits the breeder I purchased from breeds for is birds that can successfully mate on their own. Do keep in mind, if you plan to show your silkies, you avoid trimming their feathers, or at least do no more than the bare minimum if you have a show coming up. But keep in mind that these feathers usually don't grow back until the next molt. Another thing to mention, though, about silkies is a vault. I will link more information about this in the description, but essentially a vaulted skull is a skull that is arched at the top with a chamber inside. This is the same vault found in the Polish breed. However, unlike Polish, the silky vault is not fully sealed at the top, meaning sometimes the skin is the only barrier between the brain, and this can lead to brain trauma if a bird is pecked on the hedge. Due to this, vaulted skulls have been banned in the European standard. Because a lot of our American silkies have vaults, this is another reason why silkies should not be housed with other breeds. Another thing to keep in mind about silkies is that they tend to be more prone to mites or lice, especially broody hens who remain stationary for a long time. I will leave this topic be for the most part as treatment plans can vary between types of mites or lice, and consulting the breeder you purchase from or your veterinarian is best. But personally, I am a fan of the Elector PSP product for mite or lice treatment. Another thing to keep in mind whether you are breeding or buying silkies is that silkies are very hard to sex. Generally, you can start taking guesses when they reach 12 weeks old and can usually know for sure by 14 to 18 weeks depending on your line. Something to consider also is that the walnut comb, specifically the pea comb part of it, reduces the size of the wattles. This means that even mature silky roosters or cockbirds will have smaller wattles than most of your more common chicken breeds like Rhode Island Reds or Plymouth Rocks. In addition to that, if you're raising bearded silkies, the beard also inhibits wattle growth. Although this depends on your line, personally, when I see wattles on my bearded silky juveniles before 16 weeks old, I can usually take a guess that they are boys, although this isn't guaranteed. The only reliable way to sex silkies earlier, in my opinion, is creating a sex-linked pairing to sex chicks based on their color or doing a DNA test. I'll link some information about this in the description. Wing sexing in silkies is not accurate. Once they are fully mature, you should be able to sex them just like you would any other breed. By looking at the comb size, saddle feathers, and hackle feathers on the males, and the lack thereof on the females. You should also notice on the male's crest, long pointy feathers that look like hackle feathers on the back of the crest, and these are called the streamers. Another thing to keep in mind is because silkies are slower to mature, hens don't typically start laying eggs until six to seven months old, and roosters don't usually learn to crow until four to six months old. Sometimes if you have a dominant male in the pen, the less dominant males won't crow at all, making it even harder to sex them. The last thing, which is a pretty controversial topic, is on feed. Personally, I've had good results with using either an 18% or 20% protein feed for my adults. I've had good results with both 30% and high quality 20% chick starters for my chicks, preferably the Kalmbach brand. Ultimately, the quality of the amino acids is more important than the protein percentage. I have found that just about all chick starter crumbles are too large and need to be either ground further or made into a mash. Personally, I prefer making them into a mash just by adding water. This prevents food waste because they can't scratch the food around and should prevent chicks from choking on the larger crumbles. Like my other bantam breeds, I have also found it necessary to house silky chicks for the first couple weeks on a bedding other than pine shavings because some chicks will eat the shavings and choke. Lately, I have been rooting chicks on automotive paper towels and have found good results with that, although they need to be changed often. Another controversial area is supplements. Personally, I do not give any healthy birds any supplements except for supplemental forage and time to be outside under supervision or in predator-proof areas. I do not put vitamins or electrolytes in the water of my chicks or adults. The only time I ever use either of these products is if I have a sick bird or a bird about to undergo a stress such as moving to a new home, moving in with different birds, or occasionally a broody hen. However, I do this as a preventative or booster rather than as a necessity. The way I have always seen it is if chicks need constant supplementation for vitamins or electrolytes, then that line is severely lacking in vigor and hardiness. For example, many people will tell you that silkies are prone to rye neck. Their usual cure for this is supplementation with selenium and vitamin E gel. Personally, if I have a bird get rye neck, I would treat them for it, but move them on to another home after recovery with full disclosure or keep them in a pet pen as non-breeders. Although this sounds harsh, the reason I do this is because if I use birds that for whatever reason can't metabolize selenium correctly, assuming the issue is genetic and not environmental, 
All I'm doing is setting myself and my buyers up with silkies that will require additional supplementation rather than birds that can stay healthy on their own. Any good breeder will tell you that vigor and hardiness are the most important traits when breeding any species. Ultimately, if you're buying silky chicks, the best thing you can do is ask the breeder to see if their birds need additional supplementation or not, and decide for yourself if that is something you want or if you would rather breed for vigor. And with that, those are the general basics of silky care. I know it is a lot to take in, but keeping these tips in mind before and when you're buying silkies can save you from a lot of wasted time and money later on, and give both you and your silkies the best chance of success. The next part of this video is more of a warning to people looking to buy silkies, whether for breeding purposes, show purposes, or if you just like silkies that are quality examples of the breed. The first step in this, in my opinion, if you're looking to breed, is buying the standard of perfection. All information stated here will be referenced in the context of our American standard. So with that, I'd like to go over some of the most common faults I see in birds that are marketed as silkies, but are actually satins or silky mixes. Starting with silky feathering, toe disqualifications and defects, skin color, comb type, feathered feet, accepted colors and varieties, and finishing with how to buy quality birds. Although there are a lot of traits like tail angle and length of back that I could pull out of the standard and talk about, there's one I really want to emphasize that stands out. And the reason I don't bring up the other ones is that they're traits that you can breed out fairly easily. It won't be one generation where you get them perfect, but you can definitely get moving with the right birds. However, one trait that stands out is wings. There is more information in the standard, but the general idea is that the wings of a silky should be tight and close to the body. This shows that the wings are strong. Generally, silkies and some other heavier feather-footed breeds like Cochin suffer from weak wings, either because they aren't using them, which is a reason to encourage your silkies to roost, or just bad genetics. A great indicator of strong wings is when you pick up a bird and pull the wing back. If the bird's wing snaps back immediately, you have a strong wing. If the wing weakly pulls back or just lays in place, that is evidence of a weak wing. Other issues in wing quality that apply to just about all breeds are split wings, slipped wings, and twisted feathers, all of which are pretty common issues in silkies. And something to keep in mind is that wings tend to be really hard to fix. So if you're getting started in breeding and you don't have your breeding stock already, make sure your foundation stock has really strong wings. With that out of the way, let's talk about silky feathering. As stated earlier, silkies have feathers that lack barbules, meaning they don't zip together like regular feathers do. And by this definition, there is no such thing as a regular feathered silky. Although they are not yet recognized, many people refer to these birds as satins. Satins are supposed to conform to all aspects of the silky standard, except for the fact that they have normal feathering. But again, there is no such thing as a silky with normal feathering. These are either satins that conform to the standard or silky mixes. Another thing to bring up about silkies is toe defects. As stated earlier, silkies should have five toes on each foot. The American Phantom Association states that the absence of a fifth toe, or more than five toes, is a disqualification. However, if a bird is exceptional in all other aspects, it may be worth using that bird as a breeder anyway. The genetics of polydactyly are not fully known, but many breeders will tell you that it is easier to breed out four toes than it is to breed out six. Another thing to consider is toe placement. Although improper toe placement is not a disqualification, it is considered a defect. Silky toes should be spaced as shown in the picture on screen. Pigment holes, or yellow or green pigment, on the bottom of the feet instead of being truly black or mulberry or dark violet is considered a defect as well. The next thing to mention is skin and earlobe color. Silky should have entirely dark skin due to the fibromelanosis gene. Silky should also have blue earlobes. The next topic we will discuss is combs. The only accepted comb type for silkies is the walnut comb, which is a combination of two different comb types, the rose comb and the pea comb. I have a video on the genetics of the walnut comb linked in the description for those of you that are interested. Like the skin, the comb should be black or mulberry colored. A single comb is recessive and a disqualification in silkies. And seeing a single comb pop up is a good indication that at some point in the lineage of those birds, a single comb and breed was bred in. The next topic is feathered feet. All silky should have feathered feet. The standard states that the outer and middle toes should be well feathered, and this is something you should be able to see even in newborn chicks. The Bantam standard warns against feet that have no feathering on the middle toe and feet that have too much feathering leading to stiffness. Both are considered a defect. Currently, as of the 2020 edition of the American Bantam Association's Bantam standard, silkies are accepted in both bearded and non-bearded forms of black, blue, buff, gray, partridge, self-blue, which is lavender, splash, and white. Paint silkies and white naked neck silkies are only accepted in the bearded form. As of 
the 2020 edition of the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection, silkies are accepted in both bearded and non-bearded forms of white, black, blue, buff, gray, and partridge, but splash silkies are only accepted in the bearded form. Keep in mind that both of these associations have a class for non-standard variety silkies, meaning that silkies of non-accepted colors can be shown and win best of variety, but cannot be awarded best of breed or higher. If you'd like to get started with showing silkies, I definitely would recommend getting one of the standard varieties. And this brings us into the topic of what does it mean to be show quality? Essentially, a show quality bird is a bird that conforms to the standard and can prove this by placing well in a show setting. And with this in mind, I want to emphasize the idea that there is no such thing as show quality eggs, chicks, or even juveniles. Buying eggs from a breeder who shows regularly and breeds to the standard will give you a higher chance of silkies that will be show quality, or at least silkies you can use to form a breeding pen and eventually produce show quality chickens out of. But there is no such thing as a show quality egg. As you can see on screen here, I have a diagram showing from best to worst what you can buy to get started in silkies. The best thing you could buy would be a bird that has been shown or show winner, then an adult that hasn't been shown, then a juvenile, then a chick, and then an egg. Buying a bird that has been shown should be able to tell you that that bird is a bird free from any disqualifications. Buying a show winner is even better, but don't expect these birds to be priced the same as your average chicken, because breeding a show winning bird is quite the challenge. The next best thing you could buy would be an adult. On an adult or mature silky, you can see all the aspects of the bird and judge them against the standard to determine if that would be a good bird to purchase. And the next best would be cockles or pellets. At this age, you won't be able to see all the aspects of the bird because they are still maturing, but you should at least be able to identify wing defects, toe defects, and pigmentation defects. On a chick, the only thing you will really be able to determine is toe defects, such as extra toes, too few toes, absence of feathering on the middle toe, and pigment holes. Sometimes you can judge beard size or crest size on a chick. Ultimately, you really can't judge any of these things when buying eggs, other than looking at the parents. If you do choose to buy chicks or eggs, understand that more often than not, not all of the chicks you hatch will be show quality. Some may be breeder quality, and some might not even be worth keeping. Generally, people say that you can hatch 100 chicks and should only keep about 5 to 10. And this may sound extreme, but I found this to be true in a lot of cases. Generally, the better the parents are, the better your chances of getting quality offspring are. So if you must buy eggs in order to get the birds you're looking for, make sure you're getting those eggs from a breeder who regularly shows and is breeding to the standard. All in all, the best place to buy quality silkies would be from a breeder as opposed to a hatchery or farm supply store. But not just any breeder, but rather a breeder that has, knows, and breeds towards the standard of perfection and shows in American Poultry Association and or American Bantam Association sanctioned shows. I hope with all this information I haven't scared you away, because as difficult as I make it sound, once you get all the building blocks together, silkies really are a fun breed with a fun personality. Although they can be fragile at times, with proper care and attention to detail, silkies can live just as long if not longer than any other chicken breed out there. Overall, they make very good sitters, great moms, and are a lot of fun to raise. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.